Thanks for joining our presentation. Philadelphia International Medicine's Global Education Media Program is a monthly digital platform that invites physicians from around the world to exchange knowledge and innovative uses of medical technology, review the latest advancements in research and clinical care, and share best practices in case reviews. To contact our presenter, refer a patient, or more information, email physicians at philadelphiamedicine.com. Follow PIM's YouTube channel for more educational videos. Good morning uh, and welcome. So uh, my name is Costas Lawless. Uh, I am a professor and vice chair of urology uh, at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center uh, at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, Philadelphia International Medicine for arranging this webinar. Uh, today I'm going to be uh, talking on uh, cases in upper tract urothelial carcinoma with a focus on kidney sparing options uh, based on the location of the tumor. Uh, I have uh, no disclosure. So uh, upper tract urothelial carcinoma, as we all know, it's a relatively rare uh, neoplasm, only about 5 to 10 percent of all urothelial carcinomas and uh, less than 10 percent of all renal neoplasms. Now you juxtapose this to the bladder uh, literature, which is vast, and as a result, management of bladder cancer is extremely standardized and, and well adhered to. However, because upper tract urothelial carcinoma is so rare, we don't really have a lot of data to really drive the guidelines. So most, most of the guidelines that we use, most of the data has been extrapolated from the lower urinary tract or bladder cancer literature. As of 2017, there have been no randomized controlled trials for upper tract urothelial carcinoma compared to 238 randomized controlled trials for bladder cancer. So that really shows you uh, the discrepancy. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about renal sparing options for upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Uh, this includes a segmental or distal ureterectomy, uh, endoscopic management, and finally, I'm going to talk about a clinical trial as well. Uh, I'll go over the guidelines and a brief literature review for what, help, what helps to shape these guidelines. And then I'll also show some cases uh, which are highlighting uh, management. Um, so first, starting with the uh, NCCN guidelines on management of upper tract urothelial carcinoma. So they stratify this in a couple different ways. First of all, they do it by location. So the upper ureter, the mid ureter, and finally the distal ureter. And then the next level of stratification is by grade. So there's high grade and they're low grade, and they give recommendations based on all of them. And what they tell us is that for a mid ureteral tumor that's low grade and focal, this can be managed with a segmental ureterectomy with reconstruction. You can use endoscopic resection or you can perform a radical in you on these patients. However, for these mid ureteral tumors, a high grade tumor is thought to be better managed with a nephrourethectomy uh, as opposed to something that's segmental. Distal tumors, however, are thought to be uh, well served with a, a nephron sparing procedure in the form of a distal ureterectomy and reimplantation, and that's regardless of grade, so even for high grade tumors. However, what the NCCN dictates is that for a higher stage tumor, a locally advanced tumor, that should really be managed with a radical nephro ureterectomy. Now, the Europeans are a lot more specific in their guidelines for the management of upper tract urothelial carcinoma. They also split it up by location, but before they even get to that point, they risk stratify the upper tract urothelial carcinoma based on the criteria that I'm showing you here. And the risk stratification is binary. There's low risk and high risk, and you can see all the criteria. And it's, they also include tumor grade as seen with uh, the NCCN guidelines. However, uh, they include the presence of multifocal disease, whether the patient had a prior radical cystectomy, the actual size of the tumor, and also whether or not the patient presented with hydronephrosis, and that's something that I'll talk about in a little bit. Now, when they shaped those uh, guidelines, 
they actually used uh, in part a consortium between the ICUD and SIU, which was published back in 2016. Uh, now this consortium published two articles based on uh, their meeting. One was for the treatment of low risk upper tract uh, urothelial carcinoma, and the other was for the treatment of high risk. Now for the treatment of low risk, they do say that endoscopic management is possible. However, because of the high recurrence rate, meticulous follow-up was recommended. And they admit that there are no prospective randomized studies that are present at this point that compare endoscopic management or minimally invasive or uh, nephron sparing management with a radical nephrourethral. They also mention uh, what's been shown in the European guidelines, tumor grade, multifocality, tumor size. These are predictors of upper tract urethelial carcinoma recurrence. And certainly if you have radiologic uh, evidence of advanced tumor while they're on endoscopic management or if they develop metastatic disease, then this will be considered a treatment failure. Now also this consortium published their guidelines for high risk disease. And what, what they said is no surprise, radical nep nephroureterectomy is considered the standard of care. However, renal sparing surgery uh, is an option for mid to distal tumors for patients with either an imperative or elective indication. So elective meaning that's what they chose, imperative meaning that's what they had to have because of renal function or preoperative, uh, other preoperative characteristics. And they also mentioned that if you have a high grade tumor which is treated by endoscopic management, these patients are destined to fail with a salvage in U rate of at least up to 30% and even higher. So as I mentioned, the Europeans, once they risk stratify the tumor, then they have a treatment algorithm, which is also very detailed, just like the NCCN guidelines, based on the location of the tumor, and finally based on the risk of the tumor. And all of those recommendations are, are mentioned in this slide. So, as I mentioned, there is no prospective study comparing nephron sparing procedures with radical nephroureterectomy for the management of, of upper tract urothelial carcinoma. This is an observational study uh, which was published out of Fox Chase back in 2014. They used the SEER database from, uh, from the years 1992 to 2008, and they looked at about 1,300 patients, the majority of whom underwent a radical nephroureterectomy However, a quarter of whom actually underwent some type of nephron sparing procedure, with the majority of those having some type of segmental ureterectomy. And all of these patients had a non-high grade, non-muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. And what they showed is that if a patient had a lower moderate grade, low stage upper tract urothelial carcinoma that was managed through a nephron sparing uh, procedure, uh, they were a little bit older because of selection, and they were more likely to die of other causes, but they actually had similar cancer-specific mortality rates to those patients who were managed with a radical nephroureterectomy. And those Kaplan-Meyers are actually uh, demonstrated here. Now, one of the largest multi-institutional trials looking at their own patients, uh, uh, comparing radical nephroureterectomy to a uh, nephron sparing procedure for upper tract urothelial carcinoma was published in European Urology back in uh, 2016. This included uh, up to 300 patients, again, from multiple institutions with the authors listed on the author line. Only about half of these patients, as compared to the other article, which was uh, about 75%, underwent a radical nephroureterectomy with the rest of the patients undergoing a nephron sparing procedure, with the majority of those undergoing uh, a distal ureterectomy and just about 14% undergoing endoscopic surgery. Now, looking at the Kaplan-Meyers of this study, again, this is a retrospective multi-institutional study. As far as cancer-specific survival, it agrees what we've seen with the prior observational study in that regardless of the approach, either radical nephroureterectomy or endoscopic or uh, distal ureterectomy, the cancer-specific survival was essentially equivalent. And on multivariate analysis, what fell out was the pathologic grade and the patholo pathologic stage. Moving over to overall survival, interestingly, there was a, uh, an advantage of a nephron sparing procedure over radical nephroureterectomy, so it favored distal ureterectomy and endoscopic surgery, 
But again, on multivariate analysis, we saw the uh, analysis, we saw the grade in the stage fallout, as well as the ASA level, and finally smoking status with those patients. Now, looking at the local recurrence free survival, as you would expect, there is going to be an advantage of radical nephroudectomy because you're taking everything out, as opposed to a nephron sparing procedure where you have a higher chance of some type of recurrence. So, in this, uh, the in the multivariate analysis, uh, the radical nephroudectomy uh, was actually favored uh, for uh, local recurrence, and finally for intravesical recurrence, uh, there was a uh, they were essentially equivalent, although there was a small uh, advantage of uh, the nephron sparing procedure over the radical nephroudirect. So the conclusions of this multi-institutional retrospective trial is that distal ureterectomy and endoscopic management of upper tract urethelial carcinoma offer an increased overall survival, however, with similar cancer-specific survival when adjusted comparisons was made with radical nephroureterectomy. And a distal ureterectomy could be considered elective first-time treatment of an organ-confined upper tract urethelial carcinoma of the distal ureter because of a decreased risk of local recurrence. Okay, so now that we have that background, now we're gonna go into cases. And these are cases that we actually saw here at Jefferson. Uh, our first case is of an 81-year-old male uh, who presented to, us with, presented to us with an insidious development of a right distal ureteral stricture, really of unknown origin. And he presented to us with a right percutaneous nephrostomy uh, tube uh, in place, and we actually converted that over to a stent. This is his past medical and surgical history. Uh, he has had a AAA repair. He has what you would expect of a chronic smoker, history of lung cancer, chronic bronchi bronchitis, and he also has CKD uh, stage three with a calculated GFR of about 42. So he has some renal insufficiency. This is his uh, presenting uh, CAT scan. This is a non-contrasted CT scan. And what you see is an abrupt midureteral transition point. So between panel two and panel three with the arrows, you see a fat ureter, just like you see in panel one, and you see decompression of the ureter on the coronal cuts on the right-hand side uh, in panel three. Also the soft tissue mass, you can actually see it in the ureter uh, here in panel two. Um, another thing that was interesting about this patient is he also presented with hydronephrosis. However, he had no evidence of adenopathy uh, on his uh, initial scan, no evidence of metastases, and the rest of his staging was negative. So we took the patient to the operating room. We shot a retrograde pilogram, which is demonstrated here. And you can see, again, that abrupt transition point in the uh, mid ureter uh, with uh, evidence of blunting of the calyces and hydronephrosis, whereas on the contralateral side, uh, there was no filling defect, and you see very fine calyces on that side. So it really shows you um, the hydronephrosis that this patient actually presented with. So we took him to the operating room. Uh, we biopsied this tumor ureteroscopically, and it demonstrated a high-grade upper tract urethelial carcinoma grade three out of three. So when looking at the European guidelines, uh, Again, this patient is going to have a high-risk tumor. He presented with hydronephrosis. His tumor was actually greater than two centimeters. Uh, he had a high-grade cytology, uh, although it was only unifocal disease. So, um, and it was, there was no variant histology, but he has at least three or four of the characteristics of high-risk upper tract urethelial carcinoma. And it is in the mid-ureter. So what are our options with this patient? Uh, Radical nephroureterectomy is what's dictated uh, by the European guidelines. However, this patient had uh, CKD underlined. So in my mind, that's an imperative indication for a nephron sparing procedure. So we actually elected uh, a renal sparing uh, surgery with this patient. We performed a robotic distal ureterectomy uh, with a psoas hitch. How we prepared the patient for the operation was we removed his stent three weeks prior. When uh, intraoperatively, I completely mobilized the ureter. I performed a cold excision of the proximal ureter with a frozen section and a formal bladder cuff. Uh, I actually performed my ureteroneocystotomy prior to my psoas hitch so that my hitch actually takes tension off of the ureteroneocystotomy. I performed an extended lymph node dissection. Uh, I placed my stent through a council temp uh, catheter, and I actually did give this patient mitomycin uh, the day after surgery. 
So uh, I don't have video of the actual procedure. However, uh, this is the cystogram that we performed postoperatively. And uh, again, this uh, cystogram demonstrates uh, a findings very characteristic of a psoas hitch on the patient. And you can see the stent going uh, up into the uh, kidney. The final pathology was T3 and zero, high-grade upper tract epithelial carcinoma. He had negative surgical margins and a negative uh, bladder cuff margin as well. Now, the next case that I'm going to show is a little bit similar. This was uh, a little bit older of a patient. She was 87 year old. She actually presented with gross hematuria. She had a CT urogram, which demonstrated a filling defect within the distal right ureter. Now, we took her to the operating room to evaluate this filling defect and perform ureteroscopy on it. Here on the panel on the right hand side uh, is the filling defect as demonstrated on retrograde pilogram. You can see it's very focal. It looks extremely small, maybe about a centimeter. Uh, it's located low down uh, toward the uh, distal ureter. Um, and actually on your ureteroscopic evaluation, uh, the, it looked like it was just proximal to the intramural tunnel. We also evaluated the bladder and the contralateral ureter and the proximal right ureter a little bit higher up and saw no evidence of disease there. So, uh, on biopsy, the patient was shown to have a high-grade upper tract urethelial carcinoma. However, when you look at the European risk stratification for this patient, she really has a lot of characteristics uh, that are consistent with a low-risk disease. Uh, unifocal, uh, a small tumor size. Uh, however, it is a high-grade cytology, so that is the one high-risk thing. But however, in both the European guidelines and in the NCCN guidelines, even for a high risk tumor that's very distal, that's very focal, some type of nephron sparing procedure uh, could be performed. And again, uh, this patient was 87. We thought that she would tolerate something nephron sparing as opposed to a radical nephroureterectomy. So that's what we elected for. So I performed a distal ureterectomy and primary reimplant on her. Uh, we did this robotically. I actually have a video of this. So we are on the right hand side. Uh, I have a vessel loop around the ureter. This is the pelvis down here. Up this way is going to be the actual uh, head of the patient. So we're trying to perform a no touch technique on the actual ureter in dissecting it out. Uh, this is the XI robot that we have. So at this point, I distended the bladder. Now we're deep down in the pelvis. The disease is in this area, and you can see the ureter in that area does not look healthy. So that is the area that we biopsy. That is the area that we cut out. Uh, I'm actually uh, on the telestrator at this point, and I'm drawing out the area that I think needs to be divided. So again, this is the segment of ureter that I will uh, send off to pathology. This is the level, level of my bladder cuff. And I always distend the bladder uh, so that uh, I can actually get a good look of where my bladder is going to, uh, uh, where I'm going to actually do my cystotomy. So we're going to go ahead and cut at this point. Again, I use cold scissors to cut this. I try to avoid heat. I'll take a uh, cold, I'll take a frozen section from the ureter. This is my actual bladder cuff. Uh, you can see I've got a nice wide bladder cuff. You can see into the uh, cystotomy. You can see the nice healthy mucosa in the bladder. And now I'm going to go ahead and close this. I'm using a barbed suture to do this. I think that's an excellent way uh, to, uh, uh, to suture uh, when using the robot. I love that, uh, that back tension of the barbs. Uh, and uh, you get a very nice cystotomy that way. So I sent off my frozen section. It comes back negative. I'm going to go ahead and spatulate my ureter at this point. And one thing that I didn't show is that my ureter would not reach to the bladder. So what I elected to do was to close the cystotomy, as I showed, and now I've dropped the bladder into the pelvis, and I'm creating another cystotomy a little bit higher up toward the dome of the bladder, because I think that that's where I'm going to get my best tension-free anastomosis. So here I am doing the cystotomy at that point. My uh, uh, assistant was sucking out the bladder there. At this point, I've brought the ureter up. I'm using interrupted vicral sutures, 4-0. I've attached the apex of the ureter. This is it flapping over. Here's my cystotomy. And now I'm feeding the wire through a council tip catheter. And I'm going to control that wire with my instrumentation here and drive it up the ureter so we can actually place the stent. 
the uh, trick that I've taught my residents is that the stent actually will slide through the council tip catheter. So my council tip is actually in place here and we're sliding the stent through that and now you can see the coil of the stent in the bladder and I'm finishing up my anastomosis at this point. Uh, and again, I use almost always interrupted sutures. Uh, I don't like to uh, do running sutures. I think that kind of throws off the alignment a little bit. At this point, I'm covering up my anastomosis. Uh, I'm gonna do some relaxing sutures as well as tack the bladder up uh, just so it doesn't mobilize that much. And that's the end of the procedure. So uh, the pathology on this, this patient had a high-grade pathologic TA, upper tracheal carcinoma, um, with negative surgical margins, as opposed to the psoas hitch that I showed. Uh, I did not get a cystogram on this patient because I was so happy with the closure of both of her cystotomies. I left her catheter in for one week, and I left her stent in for six weeks. Surveillance for these patients, also, this has also been dictated or uh, guidelines are given by the Europeans. Uh, we performed a cystoscopy and a ureteroscopy every three months for the first year, every six months for the next two years, and then every year thereafter. We also perform a contralateral retrograde pilogram and a cystoscopy at the same time for complete urothelial surveillance, for urothelial carcinoma surveillance. Um, and we get cross-sectional imaging on these patients every three to six months in the beginning and every year uh, thereafter. So one thing that I mentioned uh, that I have a little bit of interest in is that my first patient presented with hydronephrosis, and this is considered a poor prognostic indicator or an indicator of high risk disease in the European guidelines. And this is something that's come out relatively recently. This was a multi-institutional uh, article, also retrospective, published in 2013 uh, from a, a, a lot of uh, specialists in upper tract urothelial carcinoma who combined and made themselves something called the Upper Tract Urothelial Carcinoma Consortium. Uh, and they looked at what the association of, hydro, of hydronephrosis on presentation was to the level of disease. They looked at 469 patients from five tertiary referral centers, the majority of whom underwent a radical nephroureterectomy. And what they showed was that if a patient presented with hydronephrosis, they had a higher chance of having uh, harboring greater than equal to pathologic T2 stage disease, non-organ confined disease, and a high-grade cancer. And on their multivariate analysis, their hazard ratios are off the charts when they have hydrant, when a patient presents with hydronephrosis and their chances of harboring muscle invasive disease, again, non-organ confined disease, and high-grade upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Now, interestingly, another thing that fell out on the multivariate analysis was the location of the tumor with a renal pelvis tumor not having as high a risk of more advanced disease as opposed to a ureteral tumor. So ureteral tumors are going to be a little bit more advanced because you don't have that renal backing uh, for those actual tumors. We actually had an interest in this ourselves. Uh, we looked at uh, a little bit uh, different twist than what the consortium looked at. We looked at the presence of uh, functional renal obstruction. So a patient who presented with renal obstruction and their chances of having advanced disease we did a retrospective and single institutional uh, review of 82 patients here at Jefferson. And what we saw was if the patient had an evidence of a functional renal obstruction, they had a higher incidence of advanced grade and advanced stage of a ureteral, so a ureteral uh, location of an upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Again, those patients uh, with ureteral tumors, just like we saw in the prior uh, article, they're, they're going to have more of a chance of a uh, high-grade disease, especially if they have hydronephrosis or, as we showed, evidence of renal obstruction. And now our theory is that in the ureter for a locally advanced tumor, uh, it's going to theoretically penetrate the muscularis propria, which can affect peristalsis and cause obstruction uh, upstream. So that, we, we believe, is the mechanism. So if you have a patient with a ureteral tumor that has hydronephrosis, most likely that patient is going to have advanced. So the conclusions for case one and one B, renal sparing surgery uh, for mid to distal uh, high grade upper tract urothelial carcinoma, you can certainly use a minimally invasive procedure. You have similar cancer specific survival with an improved overall survival compared to radical nephroureterectomy and preoperative staging is a major obstacle. However, 
if you use things like hydronephrosis, perhaps you can get a better idea of the risk of disease that these patients are presenting with. I'm gonna go ahead and show one more case. Uh, this is our case number two. This was a 72-year-old female who presented to an outside urologist with flank pain. Uh, on her non-contrasted CAT scan, she had a stone, and uh, they took her to the operating room, and they saw a tumor in the lower pole uh, of her kidney. This is her past medical and surgical history. Uh, not really a lot there. Family history, not really significant as well. Uh, her social history, she actually never smoked. Uh, she doesn't really use a lot of medications. Her other review of symptoms were relatively negative. As far as her presenting laboratories, uh, the one thing I would like to point out is that she did have significant chronic kidney disease with renal insufficiency. Her baseline creatinine was 1.7. So again, I'm ar we're already thinking of some type of nephron sparing procedure for this patient. This was her presenting CAT scan. You can actually see the calcifications and the soft tissue density in the lower pole of the left kidney. And here is our ureteroscopic evaluation of this patient. Again, we're in the lower pole here, and we're driving around the entire calyx, and you can see it is lined with this frondular, papillary-looking tumor. We took a laser and actually treated it, and at the same time that we were lasering it, we went ahead and did biopsy. Uh, so our interoperative findings was that the tumor was about three to three and a half centimeters, uh, and the pathology came back a low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. So looking at our European risk stratification, the size is a little bit big. However, everything else points to a low-risk upper tract urothelial carcinoma. It's unifocal disease. Uh, it's a low-grade cytology, um, and there's no invasive aspect on the CT urogram. So we look at our treatment algorithm. Again, this patient has uh, a history of renal insufficiency. It's low risk disease in the renal pelvis. So we're thinking about some type of nephron sparing procedure. We have a very rich history of uh, management of upper tract urothelial carcinoma endoscopically here at Jefferson. We did a review back in 2017 of our experience and other high volume institutions uh, as far as their experience focusing on the disease-specific survival, which I've mentioned here, and the renal salvage rate. What we showed is that in patients who present with low-grade disease, managed endoscopically, the recurrence rate, as you would imagine, is actually quite high. However, the disease-specific survival rate up to 10 years is also very high, with a renal salvage rate of up to 85%. Now, if the patient presents with high-grade disease, and you're trying to treat them endoscopically for either an elective or an imperative indication, the outcomes are gonna be much more poor. And our recommendations in this uh, study is what we saw with the, all the other guidelines, is, and, and that's you only do endoscopic management of high-grade disease if you don't really have much other of an option. Instead of managing this patient with an endoscopic management, we actually elected to enroll this patient onto a clinical trial looking at an agent called Mitogel. And this was really a, a, a phase three multicenter trial, but only 24 sites. It's now closed to accrual. I don't know if you've heard of Mitogel at this point. It's this really interesting compound. It's a, it's a liquid that's infused with 0.4% mitomycin and it uses this reverse thermal gel technology. So at low temperatures, it's actually in a liquid form. However, as it warms up, it begins to form a semi-solid and it actually, uh, it casts the entire collecting system and elutes the mitomycin over time. And as it contacts with urine, it actually dissolves, but that doesn't take uh, until it's, uh, days to weeks. So it's a nice way to deliver mitomycin to the uh, upper tract. Uh, and uh, again, we were involved actually in the trial uh, looking at this. So the design, it was prospective, it was single arm. And the, um, the way that we uh, performed the trial was we had six retrograde installations once weekly, and then we performed surveillance afterward. And the retrograde installations were done with an open-ended catheter. The, gel, uh, the uh, mitogel came to us on ice, so it was liquid form. We would infuse it into the collecting system, once it warmed up, it would, again, uh, cast out the collecting system, and then it would elute the mitomycin over time. Uh, the endpoints were efficacy, durability, and safety. So we performed our first uh, installation of Mitogel. The patient tolerated it pretty well. 
We estimated the collecting system to be 11 cc's. We removed the ureteral catheter and did not leave a stent in place. So this is our first installation, and this is the retrograde pilogram from it. Now, after the third installation, the patient came to the emergency room, had left flank pain, nausea and vomiting, and evidence of pyelonephritis on a CT scan. And this is actually her uh, CT scan. Uh, you can see a little bit of dilation in the lower pole of the kidney. And on the coronal shots, you see uh, a lot of dilation of the renal pelvis going down to her transition point, which looks like it's in the proximal ureter. So uh, we admitted her, we treated her for pyelonephritis, we skipped that installation, backed everything up one week, and then gave the fourth, fifth, and sixth installations without complication after that. So afterward, after all six installations, we took her to the operating room for her first ureteroscopic surveillance and actually noticed a de novo stricture in the proximal ureter, which we thought could have been related to the mitogel. We balloon dilated the stricture and did a full ureteroscopic evaluation of the patient and saw no tumor uh, visible on that ureteroscopic evaluation. And here is a view of this. So now remember that calyx we saw before, coated with tumor. And this is the calyx now. Now we did treat it with a laser. However, you see it looks pristine. There's absolutely no tumor that's visible. And you think about the recurrence rate, it's very high in these patients. And clearly at this three month surveillance, it was not there. The cytology and the biopsies were also negative for malignancy. Now we removed, we placed a stent after the surveillance. Um, we removed that after two weeks. Uh, as far as the stricture goes, it was non-functional. We performed an ultrasound two weeks after the stent removal and it demonstrated no hydronephrosis. And now this patient is 18 months out. We're still performing surveillance on her and she is still tumor free. So. Uh, certainly in this one patient, we think the mitogel was actually a huge benefit and it's helped her keep the kidney. So the conclusions of case two, renal sparing surgery for a high volume, low grade upper tract urethelial carcinoma is an absolute, uh, uh, it, it's absolutely possible. You can consider endoscopic management. You can certainly stage the procedure if you need to, do a little bit at one time, come back and do a little bit more afterward. It does have a similar cancer-specific survival with a Im potential improved overall survival with compared to radical nephroutorectomy. And finally, I do think that there is a potential for, for you know, the, the unicorn, the upper tract chemotherapy uh, for uh, upper tract urethelial carcinoma, certainly in the form of mitogel, and we're gonna be doing further studies looking at the patient. Okay, so uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you for all of your time. I will uh, look for questions at this point. So I do not see any, and uh, I think we are done. All right, have a lovely day.